Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us tonight for a conversation uh, that I am excited to have for survival reasons, uh, if nothing else. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Masha Gessen, one of the foremost writers, witnesses, and public thinkers of our age, an age that doesn't deserve Masha, but needs them. Masha spent the first part of their career in Russia writing about science, democracy, autocracy, and disease. Then, thankfully for us, Masha made a home in America, where it turned out that some understanding of science, democracy, autocracy, and disease uh, would prove very handy. Masha and I both work in the realm of narrative nonfiction, although that is sort of like noting that Babe Ruth and I both grew up playing baseball. Uh, between Masha and me, uh, we have won the National Book Award, Guggenheim, Carnegie, Neiman Fellowships, the Hitchin Prize, and the Overseas Press Club Award for Best Commentary, and many of those things, uh, most, most of those things, um, actually all of those things were won by, by Masha. Um, and in this work of narrative nonfiction that we, that we both do, there are three different engines, in my opinion, that make the work really soar, and very few practitioners um, are firing on all three. You can be you can be great on just one of those engines. It's it's truly rare when people are firing on all three. First, uh, the most basic and crucial is the reporting. Um, it's it's easy to be Tom Friedman. It's hard to do reporting, uh, to talk to people, get out there, bear witness to human beings and all their particularity and complexity. Masha always does the reporting. Uh, second is the language. The style, even if you do the reporting, uh, it's got to be interesting to people to read. It's got to be stylish. It's got to be more compelling than watching Emily in Paris on Netflix. Uh, and Masha writes with style. And then there's the third, perhaps the most elusive. Even a lot of people who have the first two engines, they're missing that third engine on the tail. The truly optional engine um, is working on the level of ideas. Uh, drawing from the intellectual realm uh, and contributing back to it. Uh, we reporters in particular tend to avoid that territory. Uh, we don't wanna be academics. If we wanted a, an insecure, low paying job, uh, I mean, we, we already have one. Uh, but a small handful of narrative nonfiction writers are very attentive as Masha is to being aware of what the latest thinking is on in the scholarship on the fields that they're writing about. They don't become scholars, but they know what that thinking is. They make sure that they are bringing it to bear on their reporting. And then they do reporting in a way that allows them to pay back the debt to scholarship with some interest, to actually add to what the world knows. Um, that's something that Masha did with, with special force in their book, The Future is History. Um, but also in, in all their books and also in New Yorker columns and essays and even occasionally on Twitter. Um, all of which to say, Masha was made for this moment. Um, to be clear, given their interests, you actually never want to be living in a time uh, and place that Masha was made for. Um, but here we are, uh, living under a fascist whose only merit is that he's too stupid to make the trains run on time. On the precipice of a dangerous election that threatens to be the first, that the incumbent president might endeavor to steal. Uh, I would rather live in a time in which we didn't need Masha Gessen. But given the time we're in, uh, I couldn't be happier to have them in our midst and to call them a colleague and a friend. Masha, welcome. Thank you, Anna. That was the most incredible introduction ever. Um, thank you. And I sorry, should... before you start, I have two programming notes Okay. that I forgot. Uh, first of all, thank you to our hosts. Uh, Lannan Foundation and Haymarket Books. Um, and second, and I know Masha is with me on this one, uh, all private parts, whether you are muted or not, must remain uh, ensconced in clothing during this, uh, during this live stream. Um, Masha, I'm so happy to have this conversation with you. You take it away for a little while and then I'll be back to chat with you. Thank you, Anand. Um, and thank you, you know, on that note, for promising today on Twitter that this would be the best Zoom I've had this week. I'm actually relieved we're on Skype. Right. Um, but, um, 
Thank you for that introduction. PTZD. And you know, I'm sorry. You have PTZD. <laughs> PTZD. Um, I uh, I could I could I could listen to you forever, and not just because you're praising me, but because you are such an extraordinary analyst and reader. And I say that you're an extraordinary reader very selfishly because, as you know, um, we met for the first time. I guess was it about six or seven years ago? Yeah. Um, in conversation about a book of mine about Pussy Riot, and you had read the book and identified in it ideas that I was not quite aware of yet. I was, I thought I was starting to think them, uh, and and you recognize them. And you know, this this actually often happens in writing that ideas that um, that we become consciously aware of are actually you know, thematically present years earlier. But those are the ideas that became the future's history. So I am forever in your debt, and um, you know I'm I'm hoping to emerge from this conversation with my next book half written. <laughs> um, but in addition to inspiring to inspiring my work, I you know as you know I'm also a huge fan of of, of your work and especially your last book, um, Winner Takes All, or is it Winners Take All? I, winners I never, take all. There, winners take all. I never remember where the S goes. Yeah, uh, there, are, there are definitely uh, a few of them. Um, it's really the best analysis of how this country is made, and I never stop delighting in watching you deliver that message um, every so often to the very people who are uh, who are <laughs> the protagonists of your book. Um, so let me talk a little bit about surviving autocracy. Um, the book began actually as an essay, um, and it began as an essay as an essay on election night, 2016. So almost exactly four years ago, I was biking home to Harlem from Queens, where I had attended an election watching party, which, like all the election watching parties in our midst, ended sort of raggedly and with much embarrassment and without saying goodbye to the hosts. And um, as I was biking, I started getting phone calls from friends and acquaintances and, and, and text messages of asking, what do we do now? And I thought, well, that's a ridiculous thing to ask me because, you know, obviously I'm living in political exile from Russia. I would be the last person I would ask, what do we do now? Whatever it is we did was wrong. But then I started thinking that perhaps there was something that I could share that I had learned over <clears throat> more than 20 years of, of living and reporting in Russia, but particularly the dozen years that I lived there, the 13 years that I lived there under Vladimir Putin, watching and thinking about the establishment of autocracy. And so when I got home, I emailed my editor at the New York Times, who was expecting a column from me about Russian reaction to Hillary Clinton's victory. I emailed him asking if um, if it would be okay if I wrote an essay about surviving autocracy instead. I have a cat drinking loudly out of a water bowl next to me. I would like to explain that sound effect. Um, so, um, so. Um, the editor was flustered and kind of said, uh, no, maybe, you know, maybe we don't know the final results yet um, or or wait or maybe no. Anyway, I got mad and I wrote um, a piece that I ended up submitting to the New York Review of Books, which ended up, I think, crashing the website of the New York Review of Books several times over. Um, it is by far the most read thing I have ever written. <clears throat> and in it, I tried to, it was called um, Autocracy Rules for Survival. Uh, and in it, I try to think about how we survive autocracy, not so much politically as psychically. Because, as we have now learned, um, it is soul-crushing. It is, it is traumatic. It is, it is living even before the pandemic. Um, it was living in a state of low-level dread at all times. Um, it was gradually losing our ability to think clearly. Um, it was, you know, it is living um, in a state of kind of constant haze. Um, and of the six rules that 
um, th that were in the essay, I would cite, I'll, I'll cite four, uh, although I stand by all of them, but these are the four most important ones to me. The first one was believe the autocrat. He means what he says. Um, and by that, I mean, if you recall, four years ago, people were talking about Donald Trump suddenly becoming presidential after he took office, which was wishful thinking. I mean, we've never actually known a, um, a presidential candidate to be transformed by the office in any meaningful way. Presidential candidates in this country have an extraordinary record of doing exactly what they say they're going to do on the campaign trail. But particularly somebody as outrageous as Donald Trump and somebody who is an aspiring autocrat. He was telling us exactly what he was going to do. And if you recall, again, you know, we were not taking it seriously that he was saying build the wall. We were not taking it seriously that he said he was going to institute a Muslim ban. We we're not taking it seriously um, that he said he would drain the swamp by which he very clearly meant waging just a frontal attack on the entire system of government. But that is exactly what he has done. And we have to continue listening to him, including you know, listening to what he's saying now about how there will be no transfer of power. The second rule was institutions will not save you. And that was an important rule because, again, if you recall, um, at the time, there was this very strong opinion in the air that, well, our institutions are so strong that a buffoon like Donald Trump can... Um, you know, can can act like an elephant and a bull in a, in, in a china shop all he wants, nothing is going to happen to our institutions. A lot of our institutions, again, as we have now fully realized our norms, culture, sets of cultural expectations, but even those of them that are fully codified can be destroyed um, or corrupted by a bad faith actor. The third one was do not be taken in by small signs of normality. And by that I mean, and I think this is actually not quite as relevant as I thought it would be because Donald Trump has moved so much faster than I expected. Because, you know, there, but there are always these periods when you wake up in the morning and you think, well, you know, I've got friends, I've got wine, I've got a job. Um, the sun came up, the sun will go down. Life goes on, it can't possibly be a, a, the permanent catastrophe that my conscious mind is telling me it is. Actually, things are probably kind of sort of normal. Again, that's the, I think this is a feeling we have fully lost since the pandemic be began. But it was a feeling that was, uh, th that was flickering in the first three years of the presidency. And finally, and I think this is the most important rule, is remember the future. And by that, I mean, don't do, we shouldn't do anything now that we are not willing to live with after. Um, and, you know, that's um, at the time, again, the, what I was in, in particular responding to was there was already an idea float, uh, being floated that we should call on electors to, to break ranks. Um, but any, um, you know, any, 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 violation of our expectations that will have that we're not willing to live with after the Trump era is over is something that we should not commit to right and for example you know I think it would be a terrible idea to create an extra judicial extra elected extra constitutional body to evaluate whether a president is fit to be to be serving in office as tempting and as almost obvious a solution as that might be so um, that essay came out and, um, um, and, you know, then many things happened. And then um, I decided to go back to it about, uh, I guess, a year and a half ago now and try to turn it into a book, partly by taking stock of what had happened and, and, um, and sort of expanding some of the ideas uh, that were in that essay into, into a very, very small book. Um, and... For this book, I went to the work of my intellectual idol, uh, Balint Magyar, who is a Hungarian social scientist, a Hungarian sociologist, whom I, I mean, I aspire to be Balint Magyar when I grow up, because the effect I invariably have, for, uh, for, uh, or the, the sense that I invariably have from reading his work is the sense that suddenly things are coming into focus. Like, I never have 
the reaction that, oh, what a brilliant insight. How did, I, how did he ever think of that? The, the reaction I always have is, of course. Of course, right? That's exactly it. Um, so my ambition was to write a book that would have that effect. Like, yes, that's exactly it. That's the thing that we've been looking at without being able to name it or without being able to quite bring it into focus. But more specifically, I went to Magyar's work to, um, to try to think about autocracy because that's what he's been working on for the last few years. Um, and his starting point is, I think, fascinating and, and super important. He starts with language. He says that in 1989, when Eastern European countries, you know, when the, when the, when the, when the Soviet empire collapsed, we started using the word of liber uh, the language of liberal democracy to talk about what was happening in Eastern Central Europe. And we started doing that for two reasons. One is because we just assumed that there were going to be liberal democracies because what else would they be, right? It was the end of history. Uh, the other was that that's the language of political science. Those are the measures and the terms that we use. We talk about free and open elections. We talk about freedom of the media. We talk about individual liberties. Those are the measures that we apply to countries to try to understand what goes on there. He said, but what if those measures are tangential? What if they're almost irrelevant? Uh, and as he said to me in a conversation once, you know, what if you say the elephant cannot fly, the elephant cannot swim? You still have not described the elephant. I have since received letters from people who point out that elephants can indeed swim. Not my point. What if I said that the elephant cannot swim? Or what if that particular elephant cannot swim? <clears throat> so what he proposed is a... Um, is a language and a way of thinking about emerging autocracies. And so he had this um, thousand page book uh, that actually just came out um, and I was reading it in manuscript that is incredibly detailed and lays out sort of all the steps uh, that we can, we can think through autocracies. Um, and um, the most important steps, uh, the, the, the overarching steps are autocratic attempt, autocratic breakthrough and autocratic consolidation. Um, and which sound fairly self-evident, right? And what distinguishes autocratic attempt from the subsequent stages is that while an autocratic attempt is underway, it is still possible to reverse it through electoral means. After an autocratic breakthrough happens, and this is usually when we're talking about the second term of the autocrat, is when structural changes occur that make it impossible to reverse it through electoral means. So that's, you know, that's when we see rigged elections or we see constitutions that have been changed beyond recognition so that elections lose all meaning or they lose all power um, and so on. So my first idea was just that um, there's a kind of poetic justice to borrowing vocabulary from Eastern Europe to try to apply to the United States. And the second idea was, well, you know, well, I'll see how well this model fits. Um, probably not terribly well because the histories are so different, the cultures are so different, but at least it will be a starting point. Um, it was shocking to me how useful it was. Not just the, the broad strokes, the autocratic attempt, autocratic breakthrough, autocratic consolidation, but the specifics, including things that we don't usually think about as potentially problematic in this country, but that he flags and it flags very usefully. For example, monopoly on political power right? Uh, meaning when the one party controls all branches of government, something that's not an extraordinary situation in the United States. He flags it as extremely risky. Well, we have certainly seen how risky um, a monopoly or near monopoly on political power can be, and we're continuing to watch it. Um, but it also, it also identified areas that um, we should look at as we understand whether what we're observing is an autocratic attempt. For example, packing the judiciary, right? something that this administration has been extraordinarily efficient at. Um, in fact, it's probably the only thing other than siphoning money 
that this administration has been truly efficient in doing. In fact, it's probably the only uh, the only aspect of governing that this administration has actually taken on and performed, and that's packing the judiciary. Another is dominating the information space. And that's an incredibly useful um, idea because, you know, when we think about autocracies, and certainly when I think about Russia, I think about controlling the information space. At this point, there's no publication or other media outlet in Russia that is not controlled by the Kremlin. Major points out that it is actually enough to dominate. Donald Trump, to a large extent, uh, extent succeeds in dominating without control. So that's, <clears throat> that's a very useful idea. So I've just more or less summarized the first section of the book. And the other two sections of surviving autocracy are on language and media and who is us. Now, language and media is probably my favorite topic and my favorite section, uh, my favorite thing to think about, as depressing as it is, um, because it's where I work and um, and also in part because it's so interestingly disheartening. Right? Uh, it's, it's an amazing no-win situation. I think this is something that um, that I, I hope I succeed in showing in the book that you can have convictions and compassion for um, for the profession of journalism and realize fully that there's no way to win. We are going to lose as journalists in Trump's United States. There's no way to cover Donald Trump without amplifying Donald Trump. And there's no way to amplify Donald Trump without contributing to the damage that he does. Once you think that thought, I think things start to look a little bit different because you start thinking about the job of, uh, of journalists as a sort of harm reduction, or at least framing it in, in terms of harm reduction. Um, he's going to, he's doing extraordinary damage to this country. We are all unwitting participants in the damage. How do we make this damage less? And I think there are ways. Right. Um, they include foregoing a tone of extreme restraint that is characteristic of American journalism that leads to things like false equivalencies and you know, the, the objective style and, <clears throat> um, and both sidism. Um, it also involves, I think, new ways of posing questions. Like one of my favorite examples, and I think really possibly the most successful media undertaking in the age of Trump is the wonderful WNYC podcast, Trump Inc., which, which is great on several counts. Uh, it's, uh, it's an unprecedented collaboration for journalism. It's, uh, it's ProPublica and, and, and WNYC, and at various points, various print outlets. We rarely see journalists cooperating and collaborating across platforms um, on, on an ongoing basis like that. But a, a more interesting thing about it is the way that they frame the project. They call it an open investigation. So they're asking questions without expecting or even having a hypothesis about answers. They started by saying, we're going to look at Trump's businesses. We're in particular going to look at his real estate because we think that might lead somewhere. Come with us on this journey. Send us tips. Help us ask questions help us find answers. Um, those things, the um, the openness, the involvement of, of, of listeners and, and readers in the project make it radically more transparent and also you know, uh, clearly contribute to having more confidence in the media at a time when it's really necessary. But it also contributes to understanding that what we're trying to do is define this this moving target to understand it fully, to not come up with one story that's going to prove it once and for all, you know, whatever it is, and then and then sit back in satisfaction and then you know, um, be, become instantly despondent because it hasn't made a difference. Right? I think the the sort of the ongoing investigative chronicle is is a better way of looking at Trump, and it's and it's the project of defining the elephant, 
It's like, now let's look at this part of the elephant. Now let's look at that part of the elephant. Oh, it's starting to come into focus at least a little bit, at least for a second, which may be all we can hope for at this moment. Um, so the, and the, the final section of the book is, is called Who is Us? And it's, um, it's thinking about the redefinition of this country that is very much a project of this administration. And I think with, with, the, with the haze of, uh, that, that the Trumpian news cycle creates, we forget to think about this incredible transformation that's happening. But we really need to think about it, and we particularly need to think about it if we remember the future. Right? Because we need to redefine us again. The, the hokey Biden, Biden slogan, you know, uh, build back better, is actually not so bad as a description of the project that, um, that I hope faces us. And certainly Trump picks up on tendencies that have been evident for at least the last 19 years. Since 9-11, it's, it's this idea that, that America is a nation under siege that we're surrounded by enemies, that that we have to be paranoid and defensive at all times. But he has really succeeded in, um, you know, in, in, in narrowing the circle of us, which is which is uh, um, an, an ex, uh, sort of a concept that I borrowed from the philosopher Moshe Halberstadt. Um, the circle of us are the people to whom solidarity extends. Um, they're the people whom we consider to be part of our political community. And for the people that Trump talks to, for um, for his country, that circle is shrinking and contracting at all times. And that's a real change in the American project, right, which was always expansionist. It is now a contracting project. It is a defensive project. It is you know, a xenophobic project. Um, project in, in every way. And I think we have to understand the scale of that project when we begin the work of recovery, which I hope is soon. And I'll stop there. Um, well, thank you so much for, for that. Uh, it's such a pleasure to listen to you. So I want to start, um, so we're going to, I'm going to ask you some questions now, and then you in the audience will be able um, to to send in your questions, and and I will ask some of those. Um, so I want to start. You've talked about this kind of arc of the attempt uh, at authoritarianism, the breakthrough, and the consolidation. Uh, asking for a friend, where are we right now on that arc? Um, okay, so first of all, I, I use the word autocracy intentionally instead of authoritarianism for two reasons. <clears throat> One is because I've spent so much of my life writing about totalitarianism that in that context, authoritarianism is something distinct from totalitarianism, right? Authoritarianism is a kind of regime in which um, basically the authoritarian ruler wants people to go home and tend to their private lives while they run the country. So nothing is political under authoritarianism. Everything becomes private. Politics as such disappears. Under totalitarianism, it's the opposite. The totalitarian reader, leader wants people out in the public square at all times, demonstrating their support for him. Under totalitarianism, nothing is private. Everything is political. It's the private that disappears. So that's the distinction. And if you think about it, you know, Donald Trump is a much more totalitarian leader, right? He is a builder of a totalitarian movement. He's certainly not a builder of a totalitarian regime where, you know, by, by no stretch of the imagination there or even headed in that direction. But we're certainly witnessing the building of a totalitarian movement led by a totalitarian reader, leader. So that's why I'm reluctant to use the word authoritarian. And also just because we're used to that word, I think autocracy has been useful because it is, at, le at least at the time I, I started using it, was a little bit novel. Uh, and it may, you know, I think words that have been out of use for at least a while make you think more. So let's, let's stick with autocracy. And uh, uh, where are we in the autocratic arc, I hope? We're at the stage of the autocratic attempt. 
if um, if there's a spectacular failure of the selection, not a failure as in Donald Trump wins, but a failure as in he he doesn't leave office for um, because he can abuse the courts, uh, abuse the power of the courts. Um, and secure being able not to leave office that way because he is able to create enough chaos to throw election results into enough doubt that he doesn't leave office, right? If there is an actual engineered failure of the election, then we have already passed the point of, of no return, right? The point of, uh, of autocratic breakthrough. So I don't actually know the answer. I very much hope that we're at the point of an autocratic attempt and that attempt will be reversed um, because we voted him out of office. Um, so when you wrote those rules, uh, you know, one of the reasons that poor little website crashed, uh, not used to crashing uh, the New York Review of Books website, um, one of the reasons it crashed was, uh, you know, a lot of people wanted to do a good job at surviving <laughs> autocracy. People wanted to do their best those of us in the media earnestly wanted to, you know, felt like this is our moment as journalists to hold these people to account. Um, I think a lot of people in in all walks of civic life wanted to do a good job. Um, so I want you to tell us, Masha, how we did four years on. Which people and institutions have surprised you in holding uh, up to Trump? Uh, following some of the, the kinds of rules you laid out, which people and institutions have have surprised you in their failure? Right. Um, so, Anna, yeah, I think you know me well enough to know that my favorite answer to every question is, I don't know. So this is how it's going to go, right? Like, um, you, say, you know, where are we in the autocratic attempt, autocratic breakthrough uh, framework? That's what makes you a good journalist. I don't know, right? I, I, uh, um, so uh, how well have we done? Well, I don't know. And there's a reason I don't know, right? Um, <clears throat> but you, of course, you specified uh, your question. But um, I don't know because I feel like I'm I'm I live in a in in a kind of bubble. Now I don't subscribe to the the sort of there are two different e and equal bub uh, information bubbles in this country. That is not true. But I am sometimes amazed by how well we have done. What an extraordinary amount of thinking and writing and you know, investigative journalism and analytic journalism we have produced that, um, I mean, that is certainly more than any autocracy, any attempted autocracy in, in history. Just, you know, the the number of Trump books and good Trump books, but great Trump books, um, is, is absolutely staggering. And then I get something like... Um, a final paper from a really great student last semester who wrote that after studying with me for a semester and uh, and the course was called Trump and the Media, wrote in his final paper, um, there is no threat to democracy in the United States because we have seen that after three years, Trump hasn't managed to do any damage to any institutions. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I just don't know um, what people are thinking, how I can be heard even by, you know, the 35 people that I'm talking to more or less personally. Um, so, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure, but um, I have been really devastated by um, how much damage he's been able to do in the courts. I think we have to understand that this is um, there is a radical sort of rethinking uh, of 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 the role of the judiciary and the structure of the judiciary that will be necessary as part of the reinvention of American democracy, and that's going to be really painful, right? Because we we tend to think that um, um, that there is a kind of perfect democratic building that the founders built, and we just have to m make sure that that we live in it well and that we repair it regularly and that things that stay exactly as they were intended to. Um, that's a crazy way of thinking about democracy, but it can be also a really dangerous way at the stage that we're um, in now. Um, I think there's been a fair amount of damage done to the media, but there's also been some incredibly inspiring stuff in the media 
Um, right. So, um, so I don't know. It's 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 a mixed verdict. Um, if you you know if you look at the the prehistory of um, the Russian turn to Putinism that you covered and the prehistory of Trump, they're actually quite different. I mean, a lot of what you wrote about in the future is history, is the scarring of the Soviet period that that allowed that consolidation to be possible. Here, it's a different set of factors. Can you describe, a lot of people have different theories of what made our body politics so weak that this could happen. And, and it's the kind of all the devils are here answer. But I wonder, as you look at those potential explanations, 40 years of neoliberal economic policy, demographic change, the loss of kind of white power, male power, um, other explanations. What do you think are the, are the kind of principal factors that weakened us as a society and made us vulnerable to the Trumpian turn? Right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very tricky question. It reminds me of, um, I was interviewing this wonderful political scientist in Israel a few years ago, and, um, and he had spent many years studying um, Russian voters in Israel. And he had all these great theories, like really beautiful theories about why they always voted for um, the the sort of autocratic far right. And then the rest of Israel started voting the same way. And he said, you know, I had all these beautiful theories. And um, and then I thought, well, why, you know, if 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 it applies to the entire country, then what, uh, uh, you know, how is this going to, um, what does this mean for all my theories? He said, and now that you Americans have voted for Trump, I'm just thinking it's the human condition. Um, so um, I don't think it's the human condition, but I think that we actually have you know, witnessed it not infrequently in history. And the best explanation is, I think, offered by Eric Fromm, the great uh, German the later American psychoanalyst, social psychologist, who suggested in his lovely book, Escape from Freedom, that there are times of extreme anxiety when uh, people who cannot envision a future, because the future is just too terrifying, because they don't know who they're going to be or how they're going to be. Um, and, and that is so frightening that they want to give their agency over to somebody who will just tell them what to do, take control, and in return to their handing over their agency will give them predictability. Now, I think that, uh, and this is not the sort of the, the, the poor disenfranchised white working class theory of, of Trump. It's a much more generalized anxiety theory of Trump. It's a um, you know, well-founded sense of economic and social instability theory of Trump. Um, it's also, I think, 9-11. Again, it's that sense that we're, we're in constant danger. And I think it's the, um, it's the unaddressed, um, unacknowledged psychic trauma of the financial crisis of 2008. Um, I want to ask you, switching gears a little bit, about th this kind of question of Russian interference in American politics that has consumed this country, consumed investigative organs, given the left a few years of like nightly Rachel Maddow hope, um, only to be dashed by, by Bob Mueller. Um, I wonder how you now view, given everything we know, what was the Russian project? What was not the Russian project? And how serious was it um, in, in kind of sober retrospect? Yeah, you know, I don't know what I would rather less, uh, what, what, I, what I would less like to talk about, the Russian, uh, Russian interference or last week's Zoom call. It's like, it's really, um, it's really my least favorite topic. So let me try to dispense with it quickly. Um, I think that um, for uh, for Americans and for American journalists and very politicized Americans in particular, the story of Russian interference was a really damaging sort of crutch for the imagination. It was something that allowed us 
to think about Trump as somebody from outer space, uh, or at least from Russia, as a kind of alien body, but also an alien body from which we're somehow miraculously going to be liberated. And I think to a large extent, and certainly, you know, uh, I mean, Dean Bakayev, uh, the executive editor of the New York Times, said as much, right, that um, a lot of resources were wasted, were committed to the story of Russian interference when they could have been committed to something else. And um, I hate also the story of Russian interference because I hate all stories about secrets. I hate all stories about conspiracies, not because they don't exist, right? Secrets exist and conspiracies exist. But I think it's so much more important at all times, everywhere, to talk about what's out in the open, when we can all see what is an actual felt and experienced part of our shared reality than it is to look for answers that are hidden from us. It is ultimately politically always more productive to talk about what's out in the open. And there's so much Trump out of the, in the open. And there has always been. Right? Um, and so ignoring any part of that in favor of Russian interference, I think, has been extremely dam damaging. That said, I think Ru the Russian project was, is, continues to be, um, just wreaking havoc. In that sense, uh, Putin and Trump are working in concert, not because they have agreed to be agents of chaos, but because they are. Right? Um, that's, uh, you know, the, um, the Kremlin has tried to undermine uh, faith in American democratic institutions since the, so uh, since the Soviet state came into existence and it finally struck gold, gold in 2016. But that tells us more about us than it does about the Kremlin. Um, there has been some talk now about if Joe Biden wins and we're a post-Trump era, um, what do we do with slash about various types of people who are involved complicit in the Trump nightmare. You know, so there's one conversation about high officials. Um, and there's the obvious temptation to banish them from society, which I sort of favor. Um, you know, there, there is the issue that, you know, debotification in Iraq did not actually turn out to make that society more stable. And um, so there's questions about what happens when you banish very large numbers of people from a power structure. But then there's also the question about what you do with regular Trump voters. What do you do about people who've been kind of addicted to misinformation on Fox News 10 hours a day? Um, how do you think about those questions of truth and reconciliation, deprogramming, a lot of these words that are thrown around about what we do after Trump about the Trump era? Oh my God, we could we could talk for hours about this. So let me just throw a couple of ideas out. Um, Jill Lepore had a wonderful piece in the Washington Post over the weekend um, that I agree with wholeheartedly, uh, which was an argument against truth and reconciliation commissions. Because th um, there are laws, there are courts in this country, right? The problem with Nazi Germany, the problem with the Soviet Union, the problem with apartheid South Africa, was that the crimes committed uh, under the, the auspices of those regimes or in those countries were legal. The actions that were taken were lawful. They could not be prosecuted in the courts because you cannot retroactively apply laws, right? So you had to find other ways of, uh, of redressing those crimes. I think that the bulk of crimes committed by or in the name of or you know in favor of the Trump administration are just crimes. They're just illegal acts in this country that can be prosecuted by regular courts. What I think is essential is to pursue every possible case of this. Right. I, I really hope and and I'm and I fear that this will not be the case, but I really hope that the hypothetical Biden administration will be tempted to sort of let sleeping dogs lie and be um, um, and be very restrained in seeking legal recourse. I think that would be a mistake. But I also think that truth and reconciliation commissions would be a mistake. Now, I think the question of sort of how do we bridge realities is a different question and requires thinking about it from an entirely different angle, right? Um, 
I think that as long as we think of, about it um, sort of in the in the framework of the existing media universe, we're not going to get anywhere. We're just going to um, to feel more and more despairing about this, and rightly so. Um, I think that we have to face the the problem of a lack of shared reality head on and sort of think about its its actual roots, which is that we have lost the sense of political communities everywhere, that there's uh, that local media have disappeared, that the whole idea that we were part of a, a political community connected through media has vanished, right? Um, less than a generation ago, there were local papers in every town, the, you know, the, the unspoken uh, the goal of which was to make sure that every person in the town was eventually in the paper. Right? That's what a local paper is for. Uh, less than a generation ago, everybody knew a local journalist personally. Right? Less than a generation ago, people actually learned about what was going, going on in their communities when they weren't looking. And I think we forget about that because you know people like you and I exist in a in a vast political community, where things that are going on in that community can be communicated to us by Twitter because we're you know um, because that sense of community is so expansive. But what we really need is not to try to get everybody to join that vast community. It's to think of ways to recreate the little communities um, that you know would sort of exist organically. And that, I think, means rethinking the entire media model in this country and to, to finally stop thinking about ways to reinvent this crazy, um, you know, profit-driven uh, media and, you know, and, and, and hope that at some point, miraculously, we're once again going to, to happen on an accident where advertisers need space that can also coincidentally be used for news and create political community. So let's play the bad news, good news game. So the bad <laughs> news is Donald Trump uh, <clears throat> wins slash steals a second term and remains in office. Uh, the good news is the New York Times realizes that its old mode of editing is not going to work for the times that are coming. Uh, and they hire you as the new editor of the New York Times to build a new kind of New York Times for you know, uh, what, what you kind of referred to as the breakthrough moment of autocracy. How would you start to cover, if you had that kind of organ at your disposal, how would you start to cover this administration differently uh, from what the New York Times is doing right now? Okay, for the record, if asked, will not serve. But, uh, um, but <clears throat> you know, I think that I understand why the New York Times does what the New York Times does. Um, all the New York Times has ultimately is being the New York Times, giving up its institutional culture, giving up its uh, its basic sort of ways of doing things, would be giving up being the New York Times. That's a huge loss, right? It's um, uh, it's it's easier for a comparatively much much smaller operation like the New Yorker to sort of change course and act like we're living through a national emergency, which we are. Uh, it's much harder for the New York Times. That said, I think that they don't have to be quite so married to it. Um, I think there can be more urgency. I think there can be explicit policies such as, you know, um, we will not, we will use the word lie and will not, uh, you know, uh, continue raising the bar for just how blatant the lie has to be in order for us to not couch it in euphemisms. We will, um, uh, I had an example at the tip of my tongue and I have just lost it, but um, you know, we will not use uh, normalizing political vocabulary when describing this administration. We're not going to talk about its strategies. It doesn't have any strategies. We're not going to talk about its policy priorities because it doesn't have any policy priorities. We're actually going to have um, you know, one vast editorial retreat at which we invent new language and create a new glossary for, um, for words that we're never going to use to describe this administration for fear of normalizing it. 
so in this uh, epically famous Zoom call that you don't want to talk about, understandably, uh, you all were doing an election simulation about what would happen. Uh, so setting aside the, you know, the uh, actually quite fitting outcome of the courts not doing their job, um, what was the result of the election simulation that you ran? I, you know, am I sworn to secrecy about the results of the election stimulation is a question uh, that probably comes to mind last when thinking about that um, <clears throat> that Zoom call. But considering that it is likely never to see the light of day these days, um, I mean, it was supposed to be the, uh, the radio hour that would come out this Friday, but it probably won't happen um, for all the public attention to it. Um, so we... We actually ended up with a Biden victory. Um, it was, we began, so our, our starting scenario was that uh, Pennsylvania was still counting ballots and other states uh, broke down exactly 251 to 251 electors. So it was um, all up to Pennsylvania uh, where, you know, this was before the Supreme Court terrifyingly tied in its decision about whether Pennsylvania would be able to count as it is currently expected to through November 6th. So um, our other assumption was that more people voted for Biden, but those were mail-in ballots. So at a certain point, Trump was actually ahead in Pennsylvania. Um, by the time he shut down the post office uh, and prevented the counting of more uh, of further ballots, they had actually, Biden had actually uh, gotten ahead of Trump. And so at that point he was flailing, but Biden had won. What became very clear to me in this game, I mean, I'm obviously summarizing something, we, we were at it for three and a half hours. Um, but what, I'm, um, what became clear to me though was that there was a built-in bias in playing this game because at any point, uh, first of all, I don't think that um, any of our imaginations is catastrophic enough, and I include myself in that. Um, and second of all, the uh, the motivation is to continue playing, right? Not to make a catastrophic move that would bring the whole thing tumbling down, which is distinct from Trump's motivation. His motivation is going to be to make a catastrophic move that will bring the whole thing tumbling down. Um, and do you think there is, there has been you know some suggestion for those trying to read a deeper meaning into the whole incident that there is this kind of two-tier system in journalism where there's a you know a kind of class of folks on top who are kind of able to <laughs> literally phone it in in this case but have a impunity and have you know um and just kind of live it while you got a bunch of 25 year olds grinding out you know uh, articles for very little money in much of the digital media. Do you think there are those kind of larger issues of power and privilege and impunity here? Um, here, I mean, you mean in general or here? I mean, we don't know. Um, let me say two things. One is we don't actually know what the ultimate sort of disciplinary outcome of this is going to be. Second of all, it was so clearly a completely idiotic accident. It was not a pleasant accident, but it was an idiotic accident. It was not, you know, an abuse of power by um, any measure. Um, that said, of course, of course, there's a there's a, a ridiculously a ridiculous hierarchy in, in, in journalism. There are people <clears throat> who, you know, have the luxury there and, and media outlets that have the luxury of of funding great journalism. Right, or of doing great journalism. Great journalism requires time more than anything else. Uh, if um, you have to, yeah, go ahead. I want to ask you to, you, you've kind of one way or another graded different institutions' performance in this time. How do you think about the left, uh, very broadly defined, the left half of the country? Um, uh, and, the, and, and in particular, some of the debates that you know very well about, you know, it, do you fight Trumpism by creating in the kind of Biden mold the broadest 
in a way, most anodyne possible pitch where you don't really necessarily stand for anything substantive, but, you know, build back better, we're all in this, we're going to have some Republicans in the cabinet versus the theory um, of a Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren that we actually need to address some of these bigger structural economic issues and that the best way to prosecute Trump is to kind of actually offer something um, more fulsome in that department. How have you watched that argument? Um, well, I certainly f uh, fall on the on, on the much farther left side of the spectrum than Biden, and and I I find the idea of sort of aiming for the middle of the road in order to uh, to, to confront the extreme of the road to be fundamentally suspect. <clears throat> But, you know, if he wins, I'll be proven wrong. The question is, what happens next if he, God willing, wins? Um, I think that in some ways, Biden can be a transformative president because I think that, um, you know, there's a kind of, there's, there's, there's a grand ambition there uh, that, that's, that's become very clear, right, to, um, to to invest in infrastructure, to create a new a welfare state, to um, to kind of you know to bring the country together in some really I think beautiful ways. Um, what I don't expect a Biden presidency to do uh, is is a really essential job of reinventing actual democracy. Right? Uh, I don't think Biden, um, who prides himself on being integrated into the political system. I don't think he's capable, uh, and I'd love to be surprised, of, of, of asking whether this is such a great system and whether this is the only way to think about democracy and whether we need to question things like the two-party system, right? Um, it's very interesting that there's there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, just in, in this, in the close of this campaign, the Democrats have clearly decided like healthcare is the best thing to focus on in communicating with voters. And it can seem very strange sometimes if we are indeed living in the moment that you describe, which I concur with, if we're living in a national emergency, this guy's an authoritarian chasing a breakthrough. You know, it's very rare, if at all, to hear someone like Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer or even Joe Biden or Kamala Harris use words like autocrat, use words like fascist. There's a real desire to stay away from that stuff. And I understand the political calculation and just focus on he doesn't care about your health care. Do you understand that and think that's the prudent course for people in their position? Or is it dangerous for people in their position not to name the national emergency as it is? Um. You know, you're asking me a strategy question, which I don't think I'm qualified to answer. Uh, I don't know if it's dangerous. Uh, to, uh, I don't know if it's ineffective. I think it's wrong. Uh, I, I generally think that it, it is important to name things as they are, right? Uh, and um, and I think that every time uh, Trump's critics fail to name what it is they're fighting, they participate in normalizing it. Well said. Um, we're going to go to, to crowd questions in a second. Um, last thing I want to ask you before I do that. I think one of the difficulties in, in processing Trump as an autocrat in this period for a lot of people that I talk to um, is, is what you referred to a little bit in terms of the signs of normalcy. But it's also just the level of sophistication and development of a country like the United States um, in the year 2020 is such, and, and the institutional quality um, is such, that a president who is kind of an imbecile and an idiot and an, uh, an autocrat um, doesn't make the driver's license department stop, doesn't make the subways grind to a halt, doesn't you know result in everyday chaos in the street the way someone like him in many other countries in the world would shut life down simply through their incompetence. There is a way in which life goes on in many, many walks of American life. Um, do we need to change our picture of what autocracy looks like in a very high functioning society so that we're not 
waiting for something to happen that we've seen in movies that is actually never going to be what it looks like here? That's a great question. Um, you know, I don't know that you actually need to um, to adjust for the United States. I think it makes it more pronounced, right? Uh, because life can indeed be so normal for so long. But I've since I was uh, a kid, literally, I've been obsessed with a sort of um, with how we collapse time when we think about history. It's like we think that Hitler came to power, and then the Holocaust happened, and World War II happened, and then it was over. Um, but there were years, years when normal life uh, and a sense of, of, of politics and a sense of, of, of um, society was destroyed and eroded. Um, it is always a process. And along the way, this process grows familiar and a lot of things stay normal until they don't. Um, I think that's going to be true anywhere. Um, yes, the subways, well, the subways ne never particularly work well anyway, and certainly we've seen you know, extraordinary dysfunction with the pandemic. Um, so I don't even know that that, you know, the sort of the, the, the first world adjustment is so necessary for Donald Trump. What I think is really necessary is, is a broader adjustment of just how, we, how fast we think things happen and how we always think of history as a series of events rather than processes. Uh, so we're going to go to the audience questions now, and I have them right here on my phone. I'm not texting, I swear. Um, so this is a question from Chris Flores. Uh, Masha, can you discuss how Trump is being enabled and where we can look for the power behind the scenes? He isn't doing this by himself, and it isn't just the people who vote for him. I am so not interested in that. I am interested in what is out in the open. And I really hope that I can get the questioner interested in that too. Um, because, you know, it, that thinking that like, um, there's there's a wonderful Bulgarian um, political scientist, Ivan Kar Karstev, who writes for the New York Times. And he had a column um, a few years ago about secrets and truth, uh, in which he pointed out that truth can be known, secrets have to be revealed. Don't wait for the things that can, should be revealed. Truth can be known. It's right out here. And it's it, it, there's plenty of information right there. Can I, I mean, since I have a good record on this, can I say, I think in this whole thing that you've said a couple of times, I think there's a seed for a future book. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. <laughs> What's it um, going to be about? I think your, your uh, aversion to, frankly, an age of, conspiratorial thinking and searching for the things behind things and the notion that it distracts us from the fact that the problem are, you know, the, the things in front of things. Um, I think there's something there. I think that's a uh, good title, actually, the thing in front of uh, the things in front of things. You can have it. You can have it. Thank you. Um, can you talk about uh, any alternatives that you see to liberal democracy as we practice it in the United States? There are lots of alternatives to liberal democracy as we practice it in the United States. You know, um, we're pretty unusual liberal democracy. <clears throat> I mean, even as liberal democracies go, right? The two-party system um, only exists in a couple of places. Most liberal democracies are parliamentary democracies. Um, Hannah Arendt used to think that two-party systems were actually better protected against totalitarian tendencies because each party was always within reach of, 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 of real power. So it had the, uh, it, 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 it had the sort of the, the awesome responsibility right there and couldn't go off the deep end ideologically. Um, but of course, what we've ended up with is one party that's that does go off the deep end ideologically and is pulling the other party along toward an imaginary center uh, as the other party sort of tries to maintain the awesome responsibility of governing, which may be a sign that it's time to rethink the whole two-party structure. It's certainly high time to rethink the marriage of, of money and power in which the United States is fully unique among uh, 
more or less functioning democracies um, in the way that it allows corporate and private interests to control our politics. But you know a lot more about that than I do. Uh, the next question actually goes in that direction from Zizi Packer, I think the writer. Um, Masha declares that Trump is instigating a totalitarian movement. Anand writes about the plutocracy. What is the intersection between totalitarianism and plutocracy? You want to take that one, Anand? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is the intersection of between, between totalitarianism and plutocracy? Um, let me think about this. I mean, I don't know that there has to be one. There certainly is one um, in in this country, right? Um, I think we have legitimized the power, uh, the political power of money. We have legitimized the idea that um, that money accrues, uh, that to, that political power accrues to money, and money accrues to political power. And that is a kind of, um, you know, that, that can be a kind of precondition to, uh, to, to totalitarianism because it is so blatantly anti-democratic. I'm uh, sorry, I have, I have an eight-year-old off screen just in case I'm like making weird eyes and gestures. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little bit of parenting. So eight-year-olds yeah. are welcome on screen, off screen. We, lo we love kids here. Um, Mine are too young to be part of the scene right now. Um, based on your research of other countries, uh, what do you think will happen if Trump loses but refuses to transfer power to Biden? So, you know, when we talk about other countries, we talk about, usually in this in these situations, we talk about whose side the military is going to be on. Right. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated in the United States because the military is not the only factor, right? We have uh, we have sort of the weird um, entity that is the National Guard that is uh, the, the, that belongs to the states but can be federalized. We have the largest law enforcement uh, force in uh, in the United States is actually uh, Customs and Border Patrol. Um, so whose side are the uniformed services, the armed uniformed services going to be on? And the answer to that question in sort of traditional analysis is it depends on perceived legitimacy, um, which basically means if Biden wins by an absolute landslide, if Trump fails to tie up results in, in recounts and court battles, then the uniformed armed services are going to be on, on the side of, of Biden, the winner. But if Trump succeeds in creating enough chaos, if legitimacy is in question, then I think there is a real danger that he'll remain the commander in chief. I got to say, I mean, you know, that answer just, it like, it made me start picturing it in a way that is, that is terrifying. Um, This is a good one. Um, if the failure of the election will make us slide from autocratic, the autocratic attempt to the point of no return, how can a mobilized public organize to prevent such a failure and an autocratic power grab? What works in terms of public pressure? Um, well, the answer is then it gets so much more complicated, right? If it's if it's not an electoral mechanism, um, the whole problem with autocratic breakthrough is that it's it is the point of no return, right? So the question is kind of what's the return from the point of no return? Uh, at a, at some point, an autocratic regime can destroy itself only from the inside, right? We're seeing the absolute nightmare scenario in Belarus right now, where there has been sustained mass protest for more than two months, tens of thousands of people in the streets every weekend, people protesting all over, you know, residential neighborhoods, small towns, uh, the capital, every single day, and nothing happens, right? Because there's no connection between what the people do and, and what the dictator does. Um, you would think that 
by you know by creating uh, a large scale strike and there's not a general a pervasive general strike but there have been large stri- uh, lar- lar- large scale strikes in in Belarus and by creating this kind of protest they would have uh, uh, paralyzed the economy and forced him to leave no nothing happens right so so that's sort of the the the, the nightmare we're going to be years and years from that even if Trump manages uh, to to maintain power and even if he manages to maintain power illegitimately but so i guess i'm 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 not i'm avoiding being prescriptive but i'm issuing a dire warning we have to like not wait 26 years to have amazing you know mass protests and general strikes um this is my own question interjecting i wonder how you view uh, the black lives matter protests this summer um, and the the uh, incredibly persuasive effect it had on public opinion, um, even compared to recent years. Where does that fit in to this autocratic attempt and and moment we're in? You know where I think it fits in is it 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 reminds us that times of political crisis are also times of incredible political opportunity. Right. And political opportunity is something, you know, when when I say it, I I mean something very, very specific, which is that uh, political opportunity is when ideas that are marginal can become mainstream and take hold and become uh, central to legitimate political debate in a very short time. Right. So we saw that actually happen twice this year already. We saw that happen uh, when the pandemic hit the United States. We saw ideas like universal health care and universal basic income travel from the margins to the center of political debate almost instantly you know, in, the, in, the, in the course of a couple of weeks. And the then we saw it again. Andrew Yang. <laughs> the redemption of Andrew Yang. Uh, I've, 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 I've been on his side on that one all along. Um, and this, the second time we saw it was even more profoundly, I think, uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement, when in the course of a couple of weeks, Black Lives Matter became a an almost universally supported idea and defunding or abolishing the police became part of the legit, of legitimate political debate uh, you know when it had been a completely sort of esoteric um, idea so uh, is that going to have consequences after the election I have no idea right uh, is it going to be sort of something that will have reverberations years from now but not not this year and next year I, I don't know it's too early to tell. It's like the timing was devastating to me at the time because I thought hey, we're never we're never going to be able to to sustain this through November. Um, in some ways, I'm wrong, and in some ways, it's our fault uh, as journalists, right? Because the protests have been sustained, but the coverage of protests and sort of the conversation about protests hasn't been sustained in the media. <clears throat> um, I want to ask you in the in the New Yorker you wrote. Uh, a Russian writer who blogs under the name Alexander Ivanov Petrov, writing of a different time and place, has called this state of living provincial time. It is a time in which people continue to think and create, but in some fundamental way lack agency or the ability to be fully aware of themselves. Um, there's this two different stories that are told about art and creation and writing of the kind you do in times like this. And one story is that, th- that it's, this is kind of a bad time for that stuff because you're you know, perpetually chasing your phone alerts and you're in the state of panic and that's not no good for the creative process. Um, but there's also this kind of contrary notion that art is really good under authoritarianism because it has this greater significance and it is so important. And I have these South African friends who say the art got terrible as soon as people were free because there was this great overriding purpose and movement that gave art its focus. How do you think about the role of art in a time like this? How do you think about your own creation um, and your ability to create in the kind of mental frame that we're all in? Um, I don't think that this kind of time is good for for thinking uh, and creating. It's, you know, I have no attention span, like every other person in this country. Um, I... You know, I wrote a, a, a short book and it was like a heroic feat, but there's a book that I've been working on for years that just keeps sort of stuck in um, in one place. Uh, Svetlana Alexievich, the, the Belarusian writer and Nobel laureate, said once that the barricades are a dangerous place for an artist, 
because you see things in black and white, because you can't differentiate people, you see them as people on that side or on this side. And I think that's completely true, right? Uh, I think that doubt, uh, uncertainty, uh, and time are all productive. I think that certainty and and um, purposefulness are actually, in the long term, incredibly unproductive. It's really interesting. I mean, I, I that that I find that line a little bit haunting um, because I feel I feel sometimes drafted by these times into right. a uh, you know a a conflict mode with reality. Um, with the reality being what it is, that is that you're right is is in a way I think fundamentally different from the mode that we all pursued when we were becoming um, writers. Um, a lot of a lot of folks I'm hearing are asking about. Well, I want to expand a little bit on your conversation. Your in a way your dismissal of truth and reconciliation. Um, a question that's coming up for people is how do we heal and resolve our relationship between each other? Of course, there's multiple ways of of doing that. Um, how do you, how would you think about that problem, which I think would become a focal problem of a Biden era if there was one? Right. So that's, yeah, that's, um, it's a very different way of thinking about truth and reconciliation, if I understand the question correctly. So it's not, you know, not, not how do we think about crimes, but how do we actually reconcile? Um, and I think that is when art can become, um, extraordinarily important and um, and interesting and like great right um, because that's when we will be called upon to give up some of our certainties but by no means all of our certainties right um, everything is not nuanced everything is not subtle some things are clear some things are morally abhorrent uh, and have no justification and then other things um, are, are things that call for empathy. And then other, some things are morally abhorrent, but require strategic empathy because we still need to understand where they came from. That's where stories come in, right? I don't know whether the best way to tell those stories is, is in some sort of formal way of commissions or if we're going to see you know, a flowering of, of, of um uh, Netflix series about the Trump era or, you know, some great documentaries or some gr great narrative nonfiction. Again, um, maybe it's it's a time to think about whether uh, whether leaving it to profit making corporations entirely is a good way to um, to to come together. You know, we don't have stories in this country unless they, they, there are stories being told in the courts that are not told in the public space for profit. And um, and that probably has to change. What gives you hope? Um, well, what gives me hope is distinct from the question of, uh, of whether I'm optimistic, right? I can be incredibly pessimistic, but you know, hope is, um, is a necessity of survival and a moral imperative. Uh, I hope because that's, you know, because I have to, because a, a better future is possible and yeah. the first, uh, the foundational requirement for it is hope. Uh, I want to thank you so much, Masha Gessen, for your writing, your witnessing, your thinking. Um, the book that, that came up uh, so much again and again in this conversation has the same title, as this event, Surviving Autocracy, please check it out if you want to survive autocracy. If you don't, um, then don't don't buy the book. Um, and make sure if you do not have a plan to vote, uh, if you take anything away from this conversation, uh, make a plan to vote. Go to IWillVote.com. Please vote. Thank you so much to our hosts. And thank you so much, Masha, for everything you do. Thank you so much, Anand.